The county of Kent has a long coastline. The northeast coast faces onto the busy English Channel. Three miles offshore are the dreaded Goodwin Sands, stretching 10 miles north to south and three miles wide. Old sailors called them the great ship Swallower. Some historians say this was an island of 4,000 acres, surrounded by a sea wall, owned by Earl Godwin or Goodwin, the Earl fell out with William the Conqueror in 1068. William gave the land to the Bishop of Christ Church Canterbury. The Bishop failed to maintain the sea wall and the sea broke through. The area was fully submerged by 1089. Lights have been at the South Foreland for many, many years. When Trinity House took over, they built two new lights in 1843. The lights consisted of the main upper tower and a second tower 1,000 feet nearer the cliff edge. These were fixed all-burning lights. Ships at sea could manoeuvre to line up the lights vertically and sailing towards them guided them safely south of the sands. Unfortunately, the sands are continually shifting and by 1904 the safe passage led over the sands. The lower light was decommissioned and the upper light converted to a flashing light. The main tower is not very large because the keepers and their families lived in the two cottages alongside. A covered passage led into the tower. This is the basement room where the sperm whale oil for the lamps was stored. On the first floor is the metal cabinet housing the weights. These weigh a quarter of a ton and are fixed to cables attached to a winch in the lantern room. These weights drive the clockwork machinery by gravity. The weights ascend through this column. In the operations room is a trip lever. When the keeper winds up the weights, they trip the lever and it rings a bell, informing the keeper they are at full height. One hundred and ten turns raise the weights and it runs the machinery for two hours. There would need to be raised four times or more a night. The machinery is very quiet, driven only by gravity. The round turntable has an arm with a ball on the end. Turning the ball in or out regulates the speed accurately. This dial is a one minute gauge. The lens turret is heavy cast iron but is almost friction free as it sits on a bath of mercury. The turret has a fixed light. It is the three lenses passing in front that give the flashes. A calculated section of black followed by three lenses gives the South Foreland its own unique flash sequence ships can identify their position from this.
All around the wall of the light room are air vents which gave extra air to the burning oil lamps. The weather vane on the tower is connected to the compass rows on the ceiling. The keeper would check the wind direction and open the vents on the leeward side. In the event of the weight cable breaking, the duty keeper would shout down the speaker tube to the cottages below to summon help from the reserve keepers. An emergency handle would be connected the rod pushed forward so that the gear on the end connected it to the upright driving spindle. The keepers would use the dial as a guide to maintain correct speed. In the 1850s, Michael Faraday was scientific advisor to Trinity House he thought it would be possible to use electricity in lighthouses and set up his magneto-electric machine. In December 1858, South Fallen became the first lighthouse to show an electric light. The system was not reliable and after eight months experiment, 1859-1860, they returned to oil-fired lights. By 1872, an engine house was built. It housed two coke-fired boilers, powering two steam power generators for each lighthouse. One of each was sufficient to power the light, the other was for the emergency backup. They provided electricity for the next 50 years. Carbon arc lamps were used. In 1922, South Fallen became the first lighthouse to be powered by mains electricity and the first to use incandescent lamps. However, in case of power failure, there had to be a backup. Initially, bottled acetylene gas was used. A generator was installed in 1969, fueled by diesel. It was very noisy. Should the generator fail during a power cut, there were 24 accumulator batteries that would keep the lamp going for up to three nights. Marconi used South Fallen for some of his experiments with radio. On Christmas Eve 1898, the first two-way ship-to-shore radio message using Morse code was exchanged between the lighthouse and the East Goodwin Lightship about 10 miles away. On the 27th of March 1899, the first international wireless transmission was sent from Wimereau, France and received at South Fallen Lighthouse. Greetings from France across the ether. On the 28th of April 1899, in thick fog, the steamship RF Matthews rammed the East Goodwin Lightship. <laughs> The first distress signal by radio, shipped to shore using Morse code, was sent. The gravity system was used until the lighthouse became automated in the late 1960s. Automation meant the end of keepers. Everything was controlled remotely. Computers and satellite navigation systems made the South Foreland redundant in 1988. On a small boat, the ship's log can be filled in manually. GPS can give the boat's position within one metre. Navigation charts are displayed on the screen. A course can be set and the boat will automatically keep to that route.
The tower is only 69 feet high, but due to its position on the cliff, it was 374 feet above sea level, second highest light in England and Wales. Due south is the Coast Guard radar station at Dover, controlling ship movements in the channel. Ships large and small can now use modern facilities to sail safely.